The phylum Nematoda uh, is definitely the most ubiquitous um, on the planet, meaning that the uh, individuals are just found everywhere. And they're also the most abundant, that um, there may not be the greatest number of species, although there are thousands of species, but the fact that you can find um, high numbers of individuals, they're just found in extremely high densities in freshwater environments, in the soil, in marine environments. And in some cases, you can find up to one million individuals per square meter in, in some shallow water sediments. Okay, Most individuals are free living. And they live in the soil on land. Uh, but there are some notorious parasites, and I'm going to be talking about those too. This is just a list of the characteristics, some of which I mentioned already that they're mostly free living. There's some parasites. Of course, these guys are pseudocelomate. Uh, as I talked about in the earlier lecture, they have open circulatory systems. So the fluid within the pseudocele serves a circulatory function. Um, they have complete digestive tracts from mouth to anus. Um, some of the things I haven't talked about yet is that they have a structure called a cuticle, which I'm going to talk more about, and the fact that that is molted periodically. And remember that the nematodes are um, an ectisozoan, and, and that's one of the, the synapomorphy for that group is the fact that they can molt. Um, they don't have any specialized organs, particularly for respiration or for excretion. We don't see any kind of proto, meta, or netophridial system. Okay, they don't have any lungs or gills or anything like that. They just rely on diffusion for the exchange of gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, they do exhibit cephalization, so we'll see a concentration of nervous tissue at the anterior end of the animal, as well as other structures that they have within the nervous system. Um, mostly they're dioecious, with some uh, exceptions to that rule. And they exhibit a very interesting phenomenon called utelly, which is the fact that they have uh, individual have the same exact number of somatic cells uh, from individual to individual. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that means in a minute here. Let me start with a cuticle, which is an interesting non-cellular covering of collagen, right? Remember, collagen is a protein type. So instead of this cellular epidermis layer, you see um, many layers to the cuticle. And it's an interesting structure because it's permeable to water and gases, which allows for the exchange of materials and gases. Um, and that um, because free-living nematodes must live in the water or in really moist soil, uh, they, can't, they can't dry out. And so the cuticle really prevents them from dehydrating. So they have this kind of semi-terrestrial existence. They may live on land. Um, and and uh, this is really the first group of animals that we've been talking about that's not exclusively aquatic. Um, but they still have to be in a water film or in really moist, watery soils when they are on land. Uh, they shed the cuticle during development, which is what ecdysis means. Okay, or molting. All right, and then they do have an epidermis beneath the cuticle, and the epidermis is uh, syncytial. Remember that uh, a syncytium is when you don't have distinct membranes between cells, but that you have kind of a multinucleate structure. So lots of layers to the cuticle that happen. This is from top to bottom here, and the epidermis underlying this thicker cuticle layer. Nematodes, of course, are pseudocels, and you can see here in the cross section the um, intestine. So this is the lumen or the opening cavity inside the intestine, the intestinal wall. And then the rest of this is the pseudocelomic space, right? And so liquid in the pseudocele functions as an open circulatory system, which I've said a number of times now. One thing that's interesting about nematodes is that they don't have any circular muscles like we've seen in a couple of other groups. They only have longitudinal muscles. And because of the fact that you only have these longitudinal muscles, um, when these organisms move, they can contract one side or the other, and but there's no um, shortening or thickening like you have when you have circular muscles, like, like in an earthworm or in... Uh, some of the other uh, animals that we've talked about, like in, like even in a cnidarian polyp. Okay, so if you only contract the longitudinal muscles from side to side, it results in this uh, motion that is like a sine wave, like if you remember your trigonometry, which is this S wave kind of shape. And that's what we mean by sinusoidal motion.
Another word for that is undulatory. It's really the same way of, of saying, uh, a different way rather, of saying the same thing. So here you see um, contracted muscles on this side of the body. These muscles are stretched out. And then you can contract this side and these are stretched out. So again, these alternating contracted and relaxed muscles on different sides of the body. And again, these are longitudinal muscles um, will give this undulatory or sinusoidal motion. And so basically when you look at a bunch of nematodes under a microscope or wherever, if they're big enough to see with the naked eye, they look like a lot of worms just kind of swirling and squiggling around. As we saw in the rotifers, these guys have a complete digestive tract, and so they digest food within the um, intestine primarily, and that digestion takes place extracellularly, therefore, right? And so I want you to, again, spend some time when you look at these critters in lab that uh, you see um, a mouth, and then the digestive tract has this uh, variation or specializations along the way. So the mouth... Uh, can be followed by a pharynx, which again is, has a sort of like a, a throat light function that helps to bring food into the rest of the digestive tract. And then that leads to the rest of the um, mostly intestine as we go along here. All right. And then finally, there is a uh, rectum where you have the storage of waste and then an anus where waste can exit the animal. So complete from mouth to anus with specialization along the way. Uh, and again, I mentioned before that they don't have specialized uh, organs for respiration or excretion. And this kind of shows how the pharynx can operate in some species, almost like um, a, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to describe this, but you have these, uh, this sort of pharynx here, the food coming in, it kind of opens up, and then this bubble here will move the food towards the intestine. I don't want to get into all the complexity of the nervous system. As you can see just from this diagram, there's a lot of stuff going on here. But what I do want you to realize is that there is uh, something called a nerve ring. Okay, so remember I talked about the cycloneuralia, the idea that there's a, a ring of nerves that goes around the anterior end of the organism. And that's a main feature of many other um, individuals in, in, in phyla that are considered cycloneuralians. You can see some other nerves that can kind of circumnavigate the anterior end of the animal, but the main nerve ring has the highest concentration of ganglia and it serves as a, in a brain-like function to coordinate movement in the rest of the animal. There's a number of other ganglia, lateral ganglia, as well as having lateral nerves and, um, as we'll see, uh, longitudinal nerves. So the nervous system is quite complex. And even though when you look at a nematode, it doesn't look like there's much of a head going on there, remember that the head is defined by the presence of a brain, by the presence of concentrations of ganglia that are responsible for con um, coordinating nervous function for the animal. I want to add that, although you can't really see it on this slide, that many species have light receptors like ocelli, like we've talked about in some other animals, as well as having chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors. So they do have a sensory system. There are a number of interesting features about the um, reproduction and development of nematodes. And some of these features, as we're going to see, are extremely valuable for the study of development and why certain species have become models for the, the understanding and study of developmental biology. Uh, first of all, they're, they're mostly dioecious. Um, so they, they copulate and the fertilization is internal as opposed to external fertilization. We don't see gametes being shed into an open water column, but we have copulation with internal fertilization. Um, they don't have a morphologically distinct larval stage like we've seen in some of these other animals, but the young emerge from eggs as like these mini adults. So that's kind of interesting. There's a phenomenon called chromosome diminution. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. And then, again, I mentioned earlier something called utelly, which is the fact that they have um, individuals of a certain species have a constant number of cells. So every individual in the species will have exactly the same number, at least of somatic cells. So this slide shows a little bit about the early development and the um, chromosome reduction that happens here. Um, so 
the, normally the, the, the first cleavage is normal. And then before the second cleavage, chromosomes of one of the cell fragment um, and much of the chromatin will disintegrate. So you see this degenerating or dis disintegrating chromatin, right? So you exclude the chromosome and then the chromatin material after the um, chromosomes become diffuse again in between the phases of, of mitosis, um, you, you end up with a lot less genetic material than you started out with. Okay, so the remaining re material will replicate and, and gets distributed to the next generation of cells. But the cells, in, in many cases, only retain about 20% of their original genetic information, which is really pretty interesting. Uh, the embryos of uh, nematodes in general are what we call mosaics, right? So they have determinate cleavage, and that means that each cell is fated to become something in particular, okay? So this determinant cleavage, um, again, is another thing that will be useful for studying development because if each cell is fated to become something different within the body, we can kind of trace those changes.